everybody. We're proud to offer this program, one of the MGFA series of webinars, and we're very pleased to present our speaker, Dr. Nancy Kunz, who is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Neurology at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. She's also the Medical Director of the Maza Foundation Neuromuscular Disorders Program and MDA Clinic Head at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Dr. Kuntz is also a member of the MGFA Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. She's going to speak to us now on understanding myasthenia gravis in your child and why you need to prepare for the unexpected. But before we jump into the program, let me just give you some housekeeping points. Uh, if you haven't already heard it, you can only have one line open. Otherwise, there's feedback. So you either mute your computer or mute your phone. We'll be, uh, you can type your questions in the chat box, which you'll see in the bottom right corner of your screen. You just type it in, and then you hit the little uh, you know, words bubble like you see in a cartoon. Uh, and we, Dr. Kuntz will try and take questions periodically. It kind of depends on where we are in the program. Otherwise, we will have um, time at the end where we can handle the questions if they haven't already been answered. Um, at, depending on the time available after the talk, we'll unmute people so that we can um, unmute them, for, unmute you from our end so that um, you can speak your questions rather than type them in. But if it becomes too noisy, we will go back to the chat box. So I just want to say once again, thank you so much for joining the program. And Dr. Kuntz, it's all yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I want to thank Kathy very much for that introduction because it leads very much into my first point of the evening, and that is with um, all of the um, uh, tasks that I busy myself with during the day, the work day, I have to say that the hardest job I've ever tackled is that of being a parent. Um, and I mean that very sincerely. Um, you know, boards and exams and studying and all kinds of things aside, um, I learned more um, about pediatrics from being a mother and had more thorny problems to solve as a parent than I've ever had as a physician. Um, this is something that I think about very frequently when I'm talking to or working with uh, parents who have children with disorders like myasthenia gravis where there can be unexpected change. I think that just responding to a child, uh, responding to all the changes uh, from them being very dependent infants to very independent toddlers, to very uh, shy um, school-age children or um, uh, children who want very much to be nothing more than exactly the same as all of their peers, uh, to gnarly and unpredictable teenagers. And that, uh, that uh, series and that transformation is something that's um, awe-inspiring to me and I think to most parents. And you add to that something that can create um, chronic needs, uh, chronic needs for dependency, um, and, uh, and also something that can change very unexpectedly um, without obvious provocation, like myasthenia gravis. And it's really quite uh, a task to ask the parent to be on top of this. So I wanted to just share that as a general thought at the beginning, and then uh, make a few comments about myasthenia in general, and then leave plenty of time for discussion at the end. Myasthenia is something that people have described for hundreds of years. You know, here's just one of my favorite pictures of Sir Thomas Willis, who was a, a physician and cardiologist, and I guess neurologist as well, who way back in the 1600s made a very, um, clear description of what is myasthenia gravis. Of course, he did it in Latin. Um, <laughs> but this brings me to the um, issue of myasthenia. Now, what do we mean by that? So 
the one root, the myo, M-Y-O, is really just referring to muscles. Um, so you can have myopathy, myositis, um, myasthenia. The asthenia part of it is really uh, inferring kind of a weakness or a loss of strength. Um, but even more importantly, um, it has always been associated with a, a description of a weakness that can be serious. Um, when it comes to gravis part of it, the serious loss of strength, but also something that is variable uh, throughout the day, depending on level of um, rest and um, over time. Presentation mode is now enabled. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, for this picture, what I wanted to do is um, try to draw a little picture of the pathway of where the impetus for movement comes. You know, the brain in, uh, in the command center would be, um, you know, more central or superior to all of this. But your brain sends down a message to the motor nerve cells in the spinal cord. And then they transmit that message down the nerves to the muscle. And you can see here a cartoon of the ner motor nerve reaching the muscle. And then as it uh, kind of applies itself there, this is magnified to, to give you a little sense of what happens actually in that interface between the nerve coming down and the muscle itself. You can see here that there are little, um, what we call vesicles, or just little groupings of chemicals, neurochemicals, chemicals in the body that serve as transmitters. When the message comes down, those are released. They float across the cleft um, or the synapse and then uh, bind on to receptors on the edge of the muscle. There are folds on, uh, across from where the nerve comes on the um, muscle membrane that have a lot of these receptors. Now, um, again, none of this was understood in any way. In, Dr. Wills, uh, Sir Thomas Willis's uh, time. Um, and frankly, even 40 years ago when I was in medical school, this was very vaguely understood. Um, it was actually only with an accident where some toxins that made people very weak and paralyzed them um, were found to bind um, onto some of these receptors uh, that people, um, you know, could, where people could microscopically and with special you know, techniques and imaging, see that there was something going on there, um, that people began to um, evolve and understand better the actual uh, structure and the functioning that goes on in the body to get the message from the brain down to the muscle. And we'll probably come back here a little bit more. You see here that there are actually um, several words and several little pieces that are um, um, uh, identified separately on the receptor side of the neuromuscular junction. Um, people have even made that more elaborate. Here is another cartoon uh, where here is the um, acetylcholine receptor, and you can see a lot of other proteins that surround it that are um, now being understood to be really absolutely necessary for the acetylcholine receptor to be placed and uh, in place and functioning at the level of the muscle membrane, which is what the sarcolemma is. Um, when, uh, uh, in, in terms of acquired autoimmune myasthenia gravis, which is really what this talk is about today, um, we know that there can be acetylcholine receptor antibodies. We also know that people have identified individuals who have antibodies against the musk protein, which is another component of this complicated receptor. Um, and uh, my presumption is that if we study this long enough, we'll probably find individuals who are now considered seronegative, meaning that they don't have identifiable antibodies, who will have antibodies against each of these different kinds of um, proteins around the acetylcholine receptor um, and have what looks like clinical myasthenia gravis. 
I did, did want to, you know, make the point that there are a number of things that can go wrong with neuromuscular transmission in children. When we say congenital myasthenic syndrome, that is really meant to um, identify uh, genetic or inherited disorders where constitutionally there's something wrong, a mutation or some kind of malfunction in the genes that code for all of those fancy different proteins that we saw. So we know, for example, just looking back here, that there are rapsin deficient kinds of congenital myasthenic syndrome. There are multiple uh, subunits of the acetylcholine receptor uh, gene mutations that can cause a congenital myasthenic syndrome, agrin deficiency, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but we won't talk about those today. They're relatively rare. And um, uh, you know what, what is known about these has expanded incredibly over the last several decades. And it's certainly worth talking about. Um, perhaps we can create another um, chance to talk more about congenital myasthenic syndrome. We also know that there are both therapeutic drugs, things like um, certain antibiotics, and also toxins, um, toxins that are used by um, uh, biologic uh, um, organisms like ticks and, and snakes that can produce these um, proteins that serve to paralyze their um, prey. Um, there are also um, very common chemical um, chemicals and ions like magnesium uh, that can affect the neuromuscular transmission. Um, that's used therapeutically. For example, magnesium used to be the drug of choice in eclampsia in pregnant women to try to uh, decrease their motor responses and uh, prevent um, them from having seizures. Um, but it also creates problems for people who have any other disorder of neuromuscular transmission so that any um, magnesium that's either in medication um, or homeopathic preparations, or in over-the-counter medicines such as Maalox um, uh, can uh, have an additional uh, amount of dysfunction of the neuromuscular transmission just because of the magnesium. Um, but we're not going to talk today about drugs or toxins as a cause. We also won't talk um, about uh, uh, the passive transfer of antibodies from mothers with myasthenia to their babies across the placenta, which can cause a very transient uh, form of neonatal um, uh, autoimmune myasthenia. It produces additional antibodies. They just passively gotten the protein from their mother and can be protective antibodies, such like uh, protection against chickenpox and influenza and other things like that. Um, those passively transferred in, um, antibodies fade away very quickly, so they're not a long problem. What we'll talk about today more is what are the characteristics of autoimmune or acquired myositis in children. Um, there are some forms of uh, uh, autoimmune disorders that affect the release of the um, acetylcholine transmitter that dots in the bubble on the initial cartoon, but this is very rare in children. What um, we'd like to talk about today is when there are immune responses and antibodies that develop against the um, acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic um, or the muscle side of the synapse between nerve and muscle. And that's what we've all come to know as myasthenia gravis. Um, can people hear me a little bit better now? Is that better? Let me know if it isn't, okay? Um, I think fatigue um, is very interesting. It's very important to um, separate fatigue from weakness. So what I mean by fatigue is um, uh, that tiredness. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know. Um, 
that tiredness. And no one can be fatigued as much as um, your average adolescent. Um, there is, in both adults and children, certain muscles that tend to be affected more uh, by autoimmune myasthenia gravis than others. Um, and the darker and more solid the coloring is in this um, the graphic, the more likely those muscles are to be affected by um, acquired autoimmune myasthenia. So the word distal muscles, meaning toes and fingers, can be affected, but they tend to be affected much less frequently than you know, shoulder and hip girdle muscles, facial muscles, feet and muscles, and your chest wall or respiratory muscles. But the other point to be made uh, with this is to really think of the 300 to 400 muscles in the body and realize you know, with all of that, um, uh, the nerves coming from the spinal cord out to the muscle, that there are almost an infinite number of individual connections between the nerve and the muscle. And it's somewhat random where the antibodies strike so that um, uh, everyone's myasthenia, I've been impressed, tends to be different. And you really need to um, uh, watch each um, individual person um, uh, to understand their myasthenia. Also, uh, some people tend to have uh, a predictable pattern of weakness such that it, if they have a recurrence or a worsening, the same muscles, so they can predict which muscles will be worse. But it's also possible to have a different pattern of weakness develop in another um, bad bout, as it were. Um, so it's really very important uh, to pay attention to how patchy or variable the myasthenia can be. Uh, we've just talked a little bit about the areas that can be the most affected. So for example, for example, um, uh, the eyes. Um, I, I actually think that one of the reasons that the eyes may be more of a target uh, is that we need fine control over our eye muscles so that we can have perfect binocular vision and in an instant move our eyes from straight ahead to over to the side and still have such perfect, um, perfectly targeted um, viewing of objects that we don't get uh, double images, that both eyes are seeing exactly the same object with perfect, um, uh, perfect superimposition uh, of the image um, as it comes into the two different eyes. Um, to accomplish that, we have many fewer individual muscles per uh, axon or nerve out to the muscle. Uh, that's one theory, uh, but again, of course, we don't know exactly why. Now, tophus is um, uh, drooping of the eyelid. So when kind of your, uh, it's something that happens to all of us as we age. It's something that um, is uh, definitely present when we're tired, where our eyelids just kind of begin drooping. But it's also something that occurs with um, the effort of keeping your eyes open um, normal amounts during the day in individuals with myasthenia. And in children, uh, to be a, a very common uh, symptom at the onset of uh, myasthenia. Um, so diplopia is something that refers to seeing double. Um, so again, if your eyes are not precisely targeted, um, in, in a conjugate manner, uh, there will be separate images uh, from each eye. Um, and when that first happens, I mean, we can, we can, most of us, voluntarily cross our eyes and create that, and it's very uh, disconcerting. If that happens for a long time to very young children, they can shut out the input from one eye to make sense of the universe. The brain uh, suppresses the image from one eye enough that that eye can actually go blind. That's what um, uh, 
that, that that's what uh, strabismus can cause amblyopia or um, loss uh, loss of vision in one eye. That won't happen with adults. Once you have a more formed brain, um, if you get uh, this distressing input from um, double vision, you see double, and your only options are to um, improve the cause of the double vision, or use a patch or prisms uh, to uh, change the input, prisms in your glasses. Um, one of the things that's very important, especially in adults, is that uh, there are other causes of um, double vision. Um, and some of that can be, uh, for example, diabetic um, neuropathy affecting the um, nerves to the eyes. Um, but that usually affects the pupil um, and the pupil's ability to uh, constrict to light, and it's frequently painful. Um, uh, we have increasing numbers of diabetic children, so this this the, this point of um, double vision in myasthenia not causing eye pain or or failure of the pupils to react is one that we may need to be uh, um, applying a bit more in children. But in general, that would be diabetic neuropathy um, affecting uh, the nerves to the eye it tends to be a late complication. Um, when people say bulbar weakness as a symptom of myasthenia gravis, they're really um, um, using uh, sort of a an kind of behind the scenes term. When you actually look at the portion of the lower brain, the brain stem, uh, that uh, has the motor nerve cells for uh, parts of the body that control speech and swallowing and chewing, uh, it actually uh, physically looks like the bulb of um, an iris or another flower. So that's why uh, people call it bulbar weakness. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. It's just kind of an old-fashioned um, term for neurologists. But it's very important because these functions are things that are critical to um, being independent and functioning well in life, and with them not working well, it can affect nutrition, uh, socialization, um, and uh, be a create a risk for respiratory problems if swallowing doesn't happen uh, perfectly. Um, it's not only swallowing food that's important, um, because we can always get around nutritional things by having tube feedings or even IV feedings with total you know, parenteral nutrition, if it's important enough. Uh, but it turns out we swallow about 300 times a day uh, just to manage our own saliva. And uh, uh, mis-swallowing saliva is a real risky thing because uh, saliva has enzymes and other proteins that can create a bad pneumonia. Um, uh, and then as you saw from the the cartoon we saw a moment ago, muscle weakness um, can occur in any of the muscles, but tends to be, um, when it affects the extremities, more something that's uh, affecting the shoulder girdles or the hip girdle uh, than the fingers and toes. Now, um, one of the ways of understanding whether something's fatigable is to look at uh, the status after people have a chance to sleep overnight or rest. Um, but I think that uh, you know, fatigability isn't something very hard for people uh, on this call to understand. One of the things I do want to point out, though, is that some of the, uh, to apply all of those types of weakness or potential symptoms of what I see with the children can sometimes be difficult. So if uh, fatigable weakness, uh, drooping of the eyes, double vision, dysphagia, which is problem swallowing, dysarthria, which is problem speaking clearly, chewing problems, and things like that are uh, at breathing, shortness of breath, are problems in adults and children, it's um, that much more complicated when you have a young child, an infant or a toddler, and you're trying to understand um, what's happening. Uh, 
clearly if a child is um, uh, fatigable uh, with myasthenia, sometimes it just seems as though the infant has low muscle tone. Um, if a child has drooping of the eyes in young infants, it's much more likely to just assume that they're sleepy. Uh, with uh, infants, all of these problems, um, chewing and swallowing difficulties, can be just sort of lumped under difficulties feeding, and there are so many potential reasons and uh, causes for that um, in infants and toddlers, um, including behavior, that it, it takes longer for people to identify that as a problem. And then again, with shortness of breath, um, many times, um, the way it would manifest in an infant or toddler would be just with a weak cry or a soft voice. Um, there, um, <clears throat> people always quote um, several peaks and things of the age of onset of myasthenia in adults, one in young adults and the, another in older years. Um, there is not a clear um, uh, predilection toward um, the exact age at which um, autoimmune myasthenia occurs in children. I think the most interesting thing is that it seems to behave a little differently if the onset is in very young children before puberty or if it's after puberty. Um, in teenagers and post-pubertal children, as in adults, there appear to be more women or more girls that are affected than boys. But if you look at children who have their onset of myasthenia before puberty, it tends to be even um, incidence, boys and girls. I'm sure that's related in some way to the impact of hormonal influences on uh, the immune system. Um, the, uh, there have been uh, some summaries of pediatric myasthenia, like this one that was published in 1997 that quote only a 10% um, incidence of children presenting with their myasthenia with ocular um, symptoms. However, I think most of my experience and most of the um, uh, series that have been published in this uh, decade um, would suggest that it's a higher incidence of ocular presentation. Um, one of the uh, other things I think it's very important, and I like to point out to parents early when I'm uh, working with them around their child's myasthenia, is that individuals who have myasthenia have an increased incidence of other types of autoimmune disorders in both themselves and in their extended family. Um, and in particular, a thyroid disease appears to occur much more frequently in individuals with myasthenia than um, in the general population. And this is just important because thyroid uh, disease um, frequently causes people to be uh, tired, um, both during uh, particularly uh, dramatic um, overactivity of the thyroid, but definitely during um, uh, either primary low or hypothyroidism, or what happens after the initial overactivity of the thyroid generally becomes underactive. And fatigue, if it's due to hypothyroidism, won't respond to any of the leukemia treatments. So it's very important to realize that all symptoms that occur in a child with myasthenia may not be related to their myasthenia. Um, many people have not it really had explained to them what the thymus gland is. The thymus gland is part of the kind of immune surveillance, or people call it reticuloendothelial system, but the bottom line is the lymph nodes in your body, your spleen, and your thymus gland are all part of um, you know, surveilling your body for things that um, are present or don't belong there. The thymus gland is very big in young children. Um, this is a chest x-ray down here of a child, and you can see all the ribs. This nice little contour here is the heart. But what a lot of this is is just a, um, in a slightly rotated um, uh, chest x-ray um, showing an exuberant 
thymus gland in a younger child. Um, and you can see up here in what is a drawing, you can see the neck, um, the trachea, and all coming down here, the heart back down here, but this is the thymus gland. So it's not a, a smooth or compact um, uh, organ. It's really something that reminds me much more of a, a, a full-blown ginger root where there are a bunch of knobs and a bunch of gnarly little pieces um, on it. The thymus gland uh, is paid attention to uh, because of the fact that um, there are a, a fraction, a small fraction of adults with um, um, myasthenia who are detected uh, uh, to have thymomas, or actual tumors, in the thymus. Most of the time in adults, the thymus has just shrunk with age and is uh, much smaller than you see in this picture here, you know, just really barely creating much of a shadow around the spine and vertebra. But in children, um, while the, the thymus is much more active and much larger, there's a very rare occurrence of thymoma. In my own practice, I haven't diagnosed a thymoma ever in any of my myasthenic patients. I did see one patient as a second opinion who had a, a thymoma. And as I've uh, had the opportunity to meet families around the country speaking at some myasthenia gravis uh, foundation uh, conferences and settings, uh, two other families have come to share their stories with me. So I used to make um, the statement that I wondered if thymoma occurred in children. Now I know of at least three cases, but that's uh, really three cases only with a lot of digging. Um, even when there is not thymoma in adults and children, there has been the observation that removing the thymus gland appears in the long range associated with an easier time managing the, the myasthenia gravis. Um, this information comes from several studies. Uh, this is one that was done by my teacher in neurology at Mayo Clinic in the 1980s. Um, and what he did was just look back at the um, very precisely kept records of um, all children with myasthenia gravis who've been seen at um, Mayo Clinic uh, for many decades. And what he noted is that even back in those decades when thymectomy was a much bigger surgery, um, because what was done in the 1980s is that it would uh, need to be open chest surgery, where the sternum was, or the breastbone, was divided and then the thymus removed from behind the breastbone. Um, uh, and he just uh, followed uh, the course of myasthenia in those patients. Um, there were patients, I recall, in this series as young as 18 months and others all the way up to 18 years of age. And what they found is that they appeared to have a uh, slightly greater uh, probability or likelihood of remission of their myasthenia. And remission would be either pharmacologic remission where uh, on medicine there were no symptoms or true or complete remission when even without any medications to control the myasthenia, there were no symptoms. So uh, the teaching or at least this experience suggests that uh, there is a potential long-term investment, meaning improved long-term likelihood of remission of myasthenic symptoms after thymectomy. And again, most people here are talking about antibody positive, acetylcholine receptor uh, antibody positive myasthenia gravis. There is one um, article that came out from actually Lurie Children's or Children's Memorial, as it used to be known, uh, where I'm on the faculty right now. And that was just looking at a group of children who had um, had uh, thymectomy done. 
uh, and it was just thymectomy when it seemed to be most appropriate for to both the treating neurologist, this was before I was here, and the family. So of 50 children with myasthenia, 13 chose to have thymectomy, and um, we um, they followed those uh, children over time. And what you can see is that compared to their course with myasthenia before the thymus was removed, uh, about uh, over half of them did better afterwards. 31% who were um, in who went into remission over time, and another 30% uh, or so who um, were able to do well and be clinically well with less medicine. Now, even with this um, sparse data, there is still active debate about whether removing the thymus is a helpful thing uh, for myasthenia gravis. This is um, being debated enough that there is right now an ongoing Myasthenia Gravis Foundation sponsored trial in adults, an international trial, where people have gone to the point of um, blinding the clinicians who are managing the clinical Myasthenia Gravis by having the adults who um, were uh, randomized to have a thymectomy uh, to wear um, turtleneck sweaters to their doctor's appointment so that the treating clinicians don't know whether they have a scar from the surgery or not. Um, it, uh, it, this was such a carefully constructed study uh, that it's been hard to recruit people into it, and I think that they're just now beginning to um, uh, complete the follow-up on that, so we don't really have any information out the other end. But one comment I would make, though, is that I've actually seen um, uh, abstracts and uh, a submitted article from child neurologists suggesting that for young children with um, myasthenic crises, that perhaps thymectomy should be considered as an urgent or an emergency treatment. I would um, suggest that uh, that is uh, definitely not proven, and in my experience, um, putting a child who's in a myasthenic crisis under anesthesia for any reason um, is something that should be uh, considered very carefully and probably not done until they're uh, stable and much better. So having talked around the issue of uh, should we have uh, thymectomies done in children with um, autoimmune myasthenia, I thought I would share with you very quickly uh, the evidence-based um, trials uh, for treatment of um, autoimmune myasthenia gravis in children. And this is unfortunately not a misprint. Uh, we really have no randomized, double-blinded, class A uh, evidence to, to, to guide us um, toward any particular uh, treatment plan. What I like to do when I begin treatment planning with parents is to um, uh, divide treatment into two phases. One is symptomatic treatment, and the other is immune treatment. With symptomatic treatment, it's all the common sense things, um, assuring adequate sleep and rest, which with children is harder to do than you'd imagine, um, energy conservation. For example, make sure they do their chores, but don't have them waste energy running up and down the stairs, you know, multiple times um, without an important purpose, things of that nature. Um, I think exercise is one of the things that treatments underemphasized in the past. Uh, children um, and adults with myasthenia who exercise regularly and who are well conditioned do much better in terms of uh, daily activity and endurance. Mestinon or pyridostigmine is a treatment for myasthenia, but it's really a symptomatic treatment. It prolongs the presence of the acetylcholine transmitter in that neuromuscular gap. The immune therapies um, are uh, quite variable. Um, uh, and there's a difference um, between the United States and some of the Asian countries 
um, with respect to whether immune therapies are started immediately on ocular myasthenia gravis in young children. In the United States, if we see um, uh, particularly prepubertal children with ocular only myasthenia uh, that isn't bothering them very much. Um, these young children don't drive. They're not usually reading a lot. If they are learning to read, you can certainly cover one eye or patch it or whatever so that the functional deficit of having double vision or drooping eyelids isn't that great in young children. And um, my experience is that it's not uncommon given a number of months or a year or two for the children to go into spontaneous remission. In other words, using their own immune system to kind of rebalance itself and um, uh, neutralize the um, uh, myasthenia gravis. Uh, there is a higher frequency of myasthenia gravis in Asia, and that's probably genetic in origin. And as I've met and spoken with uh, child neurologists from China and Japan, they tend to begin immune therapy immediately on ocular um, myasthenia in young children. Again, there's no data to suggest which approach is correct. Um, certainly, if children have generalized myasthenia affecting their swallowing, speaking, breathing, or extremities, uh, we in the U.S., as well as child neurologists around the world, begin some kind of immune therapy. And which one is chosen and how frequently it's used, what combinations are layered on each other, really depend on the circumstance. To get a short-term response, this isn't short-term in terms of necessarily that you're only using it short-term, but to get a quick response, intravenous immunoglobulin infusion, plasma exchange, or steroids, either IV or orally, can bring about a quicker response. Um, all of the oral agents, um, azathioprine, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, mycophenolate, and um, cyclophosphamide um, have variable um, periods of time they take to m modulate, I guess, the immune system and have an improvement in the myasthenia gravis. But frequently those are required as well, be, uh, particularly because it's um, a little bit more intrusive to use the um, IV um, uh, infusions um, uh, for immunoglobulin or plasma exchange. Um, all right. I can see that the time is going by very quickly. Um, I want to make a, just a few more points, and I'd like to actually to stop uh, before I'd intended uh, to go over a little bit of physiology about some of the testing, um, just to talk about some of the ways with children that you can better understand how they're doing with their myasthenia. Um, Many people with myasthenia have recognized that hot weather makes them weaker. Um, in fact, being really cold, for example, just coming into an exam room out of the winter weather in Chicago or Minnesota is enough to mask some of the weakness uh, from the myasthenia. Um, and so some people who are coming in for testing, for example, nerve conductions or repetitive stimulation or single fiber EMG, you can actually um, artificially hide the weakness um, um, or the abnormal test if you get someone cold enough in the muscle that you're testing. Um, um, there are a number of very easy ways that um, people can be evaluated. Um, I mentioned use of coal to repair the weakness. An ice pack can be put on uh, a drooped eyelid to see if it uh, causes the eyelid to raise up. It only takes a few minutes. It's mildly um, uncomfortable, but we can usually get even the most um, uncooperative toddler to tolerate that, and that can be very um, helpful diagnostically. Um, some of the um, uh, tests that are frequently done on adults, lying down and craning your head forward and uh, sitting and voluntarily holding your arms forward um, uh, for periods of time are a little bit harder the younger you go. but um, most children, even the young ones, can be um, teased into counting as high as they can with one breath. Or there's a published article talking about the slurp test where 
children are given a bent straw and four ounces of water and asked to get to the bottom of the glass as quickly as they can. So you t tell, tell them start, and then the stop is when you hear the <laughs> from getting to the bottom of the glass. Um, and that's something that can, I've used even over the phone uh, to talk to parents to help get some sense of how the swallowing function are going. Um, we have normals for children, but if in fact a parent tells you, you know, uh, you know, it takes over a minute and they aren't to the bottom of the four ounces, it is a very profound statement about how weak the swallowing is. And again, with myasthenia gravis, other parts of the neurologic examination like um, uh, sensation, um, um, mental status, uh, other uh, things to do with coordination um, in normally strong muscles are completely normal in these patients and children. Um, to make the diagnosis, um, I, I am a minimalist. If uh, the clinical examination is absolutely classical, and we find antibodies to acetylcholine receptors or musk. Um, I won't do any neurophysiologic testing because this is a little bit more intrusive and bothersome for the children. On the other hand, particularly for um, uh, child children who don't have the antibodies or for children who are really in trouble clinically and you need to have a real quick um, answer about whether this is a neuromuscular transmission defect that testing can be a very, very helpful. So for example, we recently saw a child who had lost 60 pounds, a young uh, adolescent girl, and who had been hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital for an eating disorder. Uh, when it became um, clear that there's uh, some atypical features and she really didn't seem like a child with a typical eating disorder or anorexia, she was brought to our hospital and we were able to show with single fiber EMG that she had a neuromuscular transmission defect. So they could quickly launch into um, IVIG um, therapy uh, and plasma exchange for her to try to bring about a quick improvement in her um, well-being before she um, developed respiratory failure. Um, uh, medications can be used on a trial basis um, to um, uh, help. Um, but what I'd like to do actually at this point in time is um, apologize for um, becoming so excited and talking so much about myasthenia from my perspective um, that we've left only maybe 10 minutes for discussion. Um, and I don't know how flexible we are on that. Um, but I'd like to stop here and see what questions people have and what other points they'd like to bring out. Presentation mode is now disabled. Are there, is there anyone with a question? I see typing. Dr. Coons? Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name is Jason Heine. Um, I've emailed you. Um, I'm from New Orleans. I know Tommy Centaur. He's part of the support group. Right. Um, my question for you is I was diagnosed uh, seronegative. Have you had any patients uh, where the child has also presented myasthenia gravis? Um, the incidence of, um, um, myasthenia, of autoimmune myasthenia gravis in children of individuals with myasthenia gravis is um, uh, very low. It's probably a bit higher than the general population, but it's still quite low. It's not um, frequent that uh, myasthenia appears in adults who have autoimmune myasthenia gravis. No, I'm, I was and one of the things you, you need to be careful about is to make sure, especially if it's seronegative, that it may not be a um, inherited or constitutional genetic form, like a congenital uh, myasthenia. Someone asked a question here about at what age should we start checking the thyroid? Um, one of the most sensitive um, clinical signs um, relating to thyroid function in children is normal growth in height. So if a child is growing completely normally, 
low thyroid or thyroid dysfunction isn't going to be something that would leap to mind. But if you have a child who's very fatigued, who's very constipated, who is not growing linearly, like taller, uh, that I think at any age you should think of checking the thyroid function. Yes, hello? Yeah. Uh, um, this is, hello? Please this is Denise, hi. and um, actually my daughter, to add to the thyroid thing, she was diagnosed with hypothyroidism before she was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, so it actually went the other way. Absolutely, absolutely. I have actually known children to have two or three or four different um, autoimmune disorders altogether. For example, well, kind of... Um, yeah, actually she, she was diagnosed with celiac disease first, and then the hypothyroidism. That's right. And then, and then the MJ. Exactly. Um, I have a I have a different question. She's now 17, uh -huh. so she'll be going to college, most probably. Um, do you know of any college scholarships that she can apply for with for them chronic uh, chronic illnesses? You know, I'm not uh, personally um, uh, familiar with anything that's related to myasthenia. I don't know if the MGFA staff might be able to help us research this. Yeah, I'm actually going to take a look right now. Um, I don't know any offhand. Okay. Uh, I did want to get back yeah. to the typed questions while we were researching that. Someone was, um, I think it was Danielle, typed in saying that one of my titles was Prepare for the Unexpected. And so um, what did I mean by that? How can you prepare? One of the things I think that's very important to recognize is that, you know, it, we have in this country um, uh, the ability to go almost anywhere and get care on an emergency situation. Um, and if you're comatose as an adult, they'll care for you until they can find someone responsible and um, figure out about insurance later and whatever. But particularly with children, in, unless the child is in really absolute dire straits and not breathing, um, if they're just beginning to struggle with swallowing or beginning to struggle with breathing or something like that, um, uh, they prefer to wait and get uh, legal permission from a parent to treat. So this means, you know, when our children are really small, it's not so hard. They're almost always with one of the parents. But as they get to be school age and as they get to be teenagers, they frequently with coaches or parents or parents of friends or other people or even if heaven forbid a parent went away for a weekend and left um, the child with a grandparent or a um, aunt or uncle, um, there still could theoretically be a delay um, in getting them medical care while they're trying to reach the parent. So what I always recommend is that um, uh, People, you know, go to their bank or to a, um, uh, you know, somewhere where you can get your signature notarized and just write a simple statement saying that you want to give this person and put the name they have on their driver's license permission to provide emergency medical authorization for your child for whatever period of time. If you date it, it will usually be at least good for a year from that point or you can give an interval of time if you don't want it to go on for long interval, and that will take a lot of the delay out of your child getting care. Another way that you can prepare for the unexpected is just by communicating with the school. I've actually given talks to, to teachers uh, groups where they tell me that they uh, frequently are advised to sort of take it under advisement if children complain of problems, you know, make them complain three times before they send them to the nurse because otherwise, quote, the whole class would be in the nurse's station all day. Um, and that works for everything except myasthenia. By the time the kids are going to tell you they have a problem, you really need to go and, um, you know, have them go straight to the nurse's station. And while everyone has the right to control access to who understands or knows about their children's health problems, my recommendation is that someone at the school campus, like the school nurse, and someone within the school, within the, the teams, the coach or someone, have a heads up so that they encourage early access to emergency care. I even um, have some families when they live in rural areas where they don't have a large enough volume with their emergency medical services system, 
that the that the EMS squad has probably seen myasthenia and treated treated it, that they actually take some MGFA literature and provide their small, sometimes volunteer um, EMS squads with information about myasthenia so that they are more prepared to, you know, act promptly and get the child to attention. So those are some of the things that I think are, are really helpful. This also pertains to going off to college because I think it's very important to have um, someone, either the RA or the child's roommate, be aware of the myasthenia. Because, for example, if you have somebody who's just a child who's a teenager who's all of a sudden slurring their speech and doesn't seem quite right and, you know, is uh, staggering a little bit or not walking real well, you know, most um, uh, most of society would initially begin thinking about a child who'd had a few beers rather than thinking about a child who might have a medical problem that is decompensating. So while you don't have to necessarily tell everyone in the world about the medical problem, you want to have that backup person there who's going to be able to, um, you know, articulate for the um, patient if something goes awry. Okay. I've missed some of these questions that have come by really quickly. Um, um, how do you make confirmation that one has myasthenia gravis without blood work um, is one question I can see here. And I would say that uh, we can do physiologic or functional testing. That's where doing the nerve conduction study, uh, where you um, essentially um, activate the um, muscle uh, by stimulating it with a, a tiny electrical pulse, a controlled small pulse. And if you do that fast in a row, uh, some, and, and there's enough weakness, you can actually see the decay in the response. Um, single fiber EMG or even in children where you do some stimulation to the single fiber EMG is another way of seeing whether you see a decay in the functional response. Um, and those are ways of uh, looking for a characteristic biomarker for myasthenia uh, or that neuromuscular transmission defect if you don't have the antibodies. Okay, here's a question about um, uh, a three-year-old having pain in his throat, um, and that's real hard. I mean, don't you love three-year-olds? Um, um, uh, you know, again, um, when children get upset, and if they really get in a, in a tizzy and cry, that's actually quite a physical thing. So some babies, um, um, I've seen babies um, with congenital myasthenia who uh, can cry themselves to the point where they um, have problems breathing or swallowing because a really bad sobbing, wailing cry may be some of the most vigorous exercise that a baby would do. Now, for three-year-olds, that's usually not the case. Um, and um, pain in your throat can be due to so many things. Some children, um, when they get upset, will actually kind of, um, you know, t tense their trunk and have a little bit of reflux. And that reflux can cause a lot of burning pain, you know, in your throat. That's one possibility. Um, uh, you know, it's also possible that the, quote, pain in the throat isn't really pain, like as in stabbing discomfort, but just problems with trying to swallow, you know. So I think trying to differentiate between those would be very helpful, and if you can't, Sometimes um, uh, having a speech pathologist watch the child, um, even to the point of, you know, uh, sometimes persisting in your exam is enough to make them upset, and then having them watch and have you try to piece apart whether it's just, you know, um, truly a problem with swallowing, which you'd want to know about and manage in a different way than if it's anything else, because if it's just a little bit of reflux causing pain or another pediatric problem causing pain, you've got more time to figure it out. Um, and uh, here's a question about um, uh, a positive ice pack test, and can that be a confirmation? Well, you know, the diagnosis of myasthenia is really one that where everything has to fit together. And if, if life were 
perfect, you'd have the perfect history, the perfect exam, the blood test uh, to support you, and then something physiologic like um, response to the ice pack, uh, cold, and um, uh, or response to mestinon. Um, people used to do an IV tensilon test, uh, which is like the mes IV form of mestinon. But that's not done very much anymore. And part of the problem is it has to be given IV. And with little children, whether it's given by um, IV or by IM injection, by the time they get over being a bit upset and maybe a little teary and nose snuffy from crying with the, the manipulation and the intervention, um, the medicine's worn off, and so it's hard to tell. So what I want to find physiologically, if I can do something like the ice pack test on the eye, and sometimes what you can do is, you know, literally take a picture beforehand so you're not depending on memory. You can also do it on, put the ice pack on both eyes um, and, uh, so that any redness or other kind of nonspecific cold effect is the same on both eyes, but to see if the one that was drooping is clearly different. Um, and uh, those are certainly something that you um, uh, need to, um, uh, uh, you know, put, put the whole picture together to decide whether it fits with myasthenia. Uh, a question about do seizures go along with myasthenia? In my experience, seizures are not, are not more frequent in children with myasthenia in general. Now, there are a few very rare forms of autoimmune attack on the central nervous system. Um, and again, we've already said that children can have more than one you know, a problem uh, that's autoimmune in nature, but those autoimmune encephalopathies are relatively rare. So, but the typical seizures in general are common. One out of one to 200 adults has recurring seizures or epilepsy. We don't usually realize that because medicines treat it, and for most adults with seizures, you're not even aware of it. More children have seizures than that, so epilepsy would be much, much more frequent than myasthenia. Um, but I don't think they're necessarily um, one increases the chance of the other. Um, there was a question about crisis that appears to be at the top of the screen. Let me see if I can get up there. Um, um, how at risk are patients with bulbar symptoms for crisis? Well, a, a myasthenic crisis is really when um, usually is referring to um, uh, patients who are having problems with swallowing or breathing. Um, it's extremely uncommon to have, you know, such bad weakness in the extremities, the arms or legs, that people are really in trouble or can't walk or fall without having coexisting um, swallowing, breathing, or speaking problems. And so um, I, I would say that patients who've experienced even minor degrees of weakness with swallowing it and or speaking or breathing um, uh, appreciate how vulnerable that makes them feel. Uh, you know, a missed swallow is something that most of us do once a year or, or two and it's kind of a scary uh, thing where just for a moment you can't quite clear your airway. Um, and to sort of have something like that happen on a regular basis um, is uh, very disconcerting, very frightening for many people. Um, and certainly if you have mild symptoms like that, you want to watch very carefully and work with your physician to try to get to a point where they're very minor or infrequent. How are we doing, Kathy? Do we have more time? Yeah, we can go for a little bit longer. Um, I see that Bill Lorenzo is typing. Um, Thank you, you for the, the, um, uh, the links. Oh, sure. Um, since Bill is still typing, I'll just jump in here for a second. Uh, MGFA has just recently uh, put together uh, resources for parents. And if you go to our website, which is www.myasthenia.org, and you look at the tab called Living with MG, 
and then do the drop down and go to parents program click on that that will bring you to a spot where there are some very interesting I think new, new resources some of which Nancy was helpful in uh, contributing to and they're uh, about your child's school success exercise and understanding at your child in MG uh, plus a variety of other things that you might find helpful so um, that's www.myasinia.org and again choose uh, living with MG and then parents program and I hope that you find those things helpful so Bill I don't see anything yet wait a minute here here we go there are a couple of other things here I see one question from Emma that I didn't really address directly and she was saying that her daughter at age six is having more problems with her eyes drooping and with double vision. Um, uh, she said something, despite increase in medications, the one thing that I did want to point out that sometimes doesn't become really very obvious is that there is a, there is a risk in mestinon use of just increasing it. Um, again, Using mestinon in adults is so much easier because you have a few standard doses. With children, it really needs to be um, correlated to the weight, um, so many milligrams per kilo of body weight. And, um, and there still is a range at which children respond. But whether you're a child or an adult, there seems to be an optimum range below which you won't get enough benefit, but it's important to recognize that above the optimum range with mestinon, you can actually get more weakness. So that um, uh, some people do well enough or, or have enough confidence that they will actually make minor changes in their mestinon dosage. And while that's absolutely appropriate to do that, you know, in uh, discussion with your physician, uh, you have to be aware that just, you know, you're feeling worse, you increase the dose, you feel worse, you increase the dose, you feel worse, you increase the dose more, that there have been times where people have actually been thrown into crisis and ended up in the hospital just from blindly increasing the mestinon dosage above what helps. Now, this may not be what you meant at all, um, Emma, about your daughter, because it might not have been an, an increase in the mestinon. It may have been increasing some of the immune modulating medicines. And I can only say that, you know, I've been there. You know, it, it is it when when you get on top of the myasthenia, it's great, but there are times when it can be hard to find the right balance. And all you can do is hang in there and then keep at it with the um, with the physician. Thank you. Um, oh. This is a great question that Bill typed. Um, since the thymus is so essential, um, how wise is it to perform a thymectomy on very young children? I think this is a great question because I asked that same question of myself um, when I was first starting to think about this. Um, and so what I did is I tried to figure out, you know, what, um, you know, how we could get at this information. Now there are a few. Um, rare genetic disorders where children are born without any thymus. And um, they can have a little bit of increased problem with infection and, you know, and immune surveillance. But um, the, uh, that's extremely a rare condition. The other thing is that um, any child who's had open heart surgery or any person who's had open heart surgery has had their thymus removed, um, and I only learned this by talking, uh, you know, to people. So uh, that basically that huge population of children who had congenital heart disease and who had curative and life-saving heart surgeries spend the rest of their lives without a thymus. And so the question came, someone actually did a study and went back and tried to figure out did, because, you know, if they like even with heart transplant, you know, um, children where they not only remove the thymus but remove the heart and put in a new donor heart and then have to have people on immunosuppressive medication. Um, 
But that's a little more complicated. But either way, it turns out that the children tend not to have um, either uh, serious problems with infections or um, increased incidence of cancer, which would be another impact of having an underactive immune system. So, and nobody knows why. If you if you do specialized testing of the types of, of blood cells, you can see a difference. So that you know it looks almost as though the particular kind of immune cells that the thymus produces are not there in the same uh, quantity. But um, somehow the kids do great. They don't have clinically important infections. And so um, a couple more questions that came through. Um, you know, the one question, um, I'm reading from the bottom, sorry about that, um, it, about the children that are seronegative. Um, actually, more children are seronegative than uh, adults with myasthenia gravis. Um, and no one knows exactly why. Um, but if you look at a group of children, the same group of children, and just follow them over time, some of them that were initially seronegative when they presented over time developed the antibodies that you can detect. Again, you know, I am a little skeptical sometimes. I say, well, maybe is it just over time we've gotten better tests? And we certainly have had more sensitive tests develop. But um, uh, it does appear to be m more than that, that the younger the child is, the slightly higher incidence of seronegative. Um, where you have to depend on the physiologic test and other things like that to make the diagnosis of, um, of um, myasthenia. Um, there are some individuals who um, have not um, uh, been willing to do, say, for example, thymectomy um, on children who were seronegative. Um, I think it just depends on how absolutely classical the case is. If they have definite uh, clinical response to medication and definite physiologic signs, and you're really sure it isn't a congenital myasthenia we've tried. Uh, we've done that on occasion. And it's, you know, again, the numbers are all so small that I think we all have to be humble and realize that we don't have absolute data. Uh, hello. Uh, this, is, this is Kathy. I'm going to just jump in and, and say that um, we'll, we'll bring this to a close in about five minutes. Okay. So I, I know there are, uh, is Bill is typing and Shane has just put something up. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can just try and uh, do those final questions. Okay. Well, I can try to put Denise's question together with Shane's a little bit. Um, and that is sort of about, about how do you find the optimal dosage and how do you space it out? Um, you know, I think what I like to try to do is start the medicine uh, at a time, the mesinon, the symptomatic medicine, at a time when the child can be with their parents, you know, for most of the day, say on a weekend. Uh, and then what I try to do is start with one individual dose. Um, and you do it on what would be an average for a single dose in terms of milligram per kilogram. And then you say, uh, just you know, plan the day to be around them all the time so you can kind of check in on them. And what you do is you see, does the first dose, how long does it take from, ta from swallowing it until you begin to see an effect? The second observation is how long until it's at its best. And then the third one is how long until it doesn't work anymore. And with those three pieces of information, you can figure out what to do next. Because basically, if you're not getting enough response, you know, then what you have to do is increase the dose slightly. Um, but once you get a reasonable response so that they're functioning well and you're getting a, a good um, feedback from that, then the second thing you can do is um, see how long it's working. And you want to make sure that you're dosing it. And it usually is every four to six hours um, to have the dose be between um, so that you're getting the next dose early enough so that it will kick in before the other one wears off. Because you'd like to be feeling good all day, not having, you know, feeling good and then all of a sudden crumping and then waiting to feel good again. Um, you know, some people recognize uh, um, that even if children really have swallowing problems, that one of the things you do is you wake them up first to give them a dose and then let them cool out or sleep a little bit more 
and then give them breakfast so that you're sure they're swallowing well um, from you know a good impact of the medication at the time that they're really trying to eat. Wonderful. And this was um, a final comment from Bill saying that he had um, a thymectomy despite being seronegative and it helped him tremendously. Uh, you know, I think that there's a real uh, opportunity for doctors and families to bond together and make sensible decisions for children in the absence of um, really good, large, randomized controlled trials. So for example, um, both in seronegative and in musk antibody positive uh, myasthenia children, families and I have decided at times to do some thymectomies on these children, and it does seem to have improved their long-term outcome. I will say that thymectomy in children these days is a much smaller risk because the surgeons now do fiber optic guided uh, thymectomy, so they do not have to uh, fracture the sternum or the breastbone to do the surgery. They just actually kind of sneak behind the sternum with their you know, uh, robotic fingers um, and the fiber optic uh, scopes. And the children are t generally out of the hospital in a couple of days and doing very well, maybe at le decreased activity for part of a week rather than six weeks to two months. So um, that's been one of the major areas of improvement. Wonderful. This is Kathy jumping in. If you're OK, I'll bring this to a close. So I just want to thank you, Dr. Kunz, for giving this talk and answering these questions. And I, I believe that it was very informative and helpful. And I just appreciate your time and effort. And I also want to thank everybody who joined us uh, for being part of this program, offering their questions. And I hope that you got something good out of it. And um, signing off for the Myasthenia Graphics Foundation of America. Thanks for all the Looks questions. like it was you're fun. getting some thanks. Yeah. <laughs>